Okay, this is the first time I'm recording a lecture. I hopefully it will be okay. Uh, we are talking about evaluation of left ventricular diastolic function by echocardiography. And this talk is based on the last guideline of American Society of Echo uh, and European Association of Cardiovascular Imaging about diastolic function assessment. This uh, first guideline about assessment of diastolic function by ECHO uh, was uh, published in 2004. Uh, in that time, the guideline uh, classified the diastolic dysfunction as a grade one, two, three, four. One was mild, two was sotonormal, three was reversible, uh, reversible uh, restrictive pattern, and number four was irreversible. In guideline 2009, they took the reversible, irreversible out and just make it as a, rever as a restrictive pattern. And in 2016, uh, they changed the guideline based on the two algorithm, one in normal LV systolic function and one in abnormal LV systolic function. And I'm going to show you. But again, between all the guidelines that American Society of ECHO, in combination with the European Association of Cardiovascular Imaging, or without them, made it, this guideline is a, one of the most confusing guidelines that American society has it. And most of the time when we go for a scientific session of American Society of ECHO, there's lots of criticizing against this guideline. And I think they are going to change it. But anyway, now we have to learn it based on this. So first of all, we have to define what is the systole and what is the diastole. This definition is based on this diagram. It's called Wigger's diagram. It shows that the systole starts with mitral valve closing. The pressure inside the LV goes up, but the volume will not change. This time is called isovolumic contraction time. This is about 50 milliseconds. Mitral valve closes, aortic valve open, is not open. And then is the ejection time, the time that aortic valve opens and the blood goes out from LV to the aorta. That's ejection time. At the end of the ejection time, that's end of the systole, the aortic valve will close. When the aortic valve closed, the diastole starts. From aortic valve closing to the mitral valve opening, that is about 50 to 60 millisecond is called isovolumic relaxation time. In the isovolumic relaxation time, aortic valve is closed, mitral valve is still is not open. So the LV is relaxing. Then when the mitral valve opened, there's a rapid filling of the LV. It's a diastasis, it means not much flow from LA to LV and is the atrial contraction at the end of the diastole that after the P wave of the ECG happens and LA will empty the rest of the blood inside to the LV. So we can say the diastole has a four stage. Stage one is a very short, is 60 millisecond, is isovolumic relaxation. Stage two is the rapid filling. Stage three is the diastasis. And the stage four is atrial contraction. If somebody is not in sinus rhythm, does not have that atrial contraction. Diastolic dysfunction used to be assessed by invasive method because most of the hemodynamic assessment at the beginning was invasive. We didn't have an echo. So uh, like before uh, 1980, uh, all diastolic dysfunction assessment was measured in the cat lab based on a measurement that is called negative DP to DT or tau. And this tau was showing how the LV 
pressure will come down and LV will relax. And this tau index is not measured anymore these days because we have an echo. Uh, we could measure the diastolic dysfunction by M mode the whole time. So M mode uh, came after uh, invention of the echo. Invention of the echo was in 1953. So the M mode, if you look at the mitral inflow, this is a very old M mode. The mitral inflow has anterior leaflet movement and posterior mitral movement and this is the E wave, F wave, A wave. At the end of the diastole there is a small bump, it's called B bump. This B bump uh, was used to be called as a sign of diastolic dysfunction. If you, you do the mitral inflow these days, you might see the B bump as a sign of diastolic dysfunction, but again, we don't use it these days. So what we should measure in assessing LV diastolic function by echocardiography? There are two measurements. Both measurements can be done by transthoracic and TE, except one, we cannot do it by TEE, and that's a LA volume. The rest, we can do it. So the guideline came based on transthoracic echo, but it can be applied to the TE as well, except for LA volume. The first group of measurement are the measurements that we do it in every patient. That's this table. And the second table are the measurement that we do in a special type of patients. So, the first thing that we measure is the mitral inflow Doppler. We put the sample volume at the level of the tip of the mitral leaflets. We have to be sure that we are at the tip of the mitral valve. And we do it in TE, for example, we do it in four chamber view, zero degree. The sample volume size should be one to three millimeter. We measure the E wave velocity. We can measure the deceleration time and we measure the A wave velocity. We can measure the IVRT uh, by pulse Doppler again in five chamber view. I will show you a slide how we do it. We can measure the tissue Doppler. So for tissue Doppler again we can measure the E prime lateral and the septal and the sample volume size when we do tissue Doppler should be five to ten millimeter. So it's bigger than uh, the regular Doppler or blood pool Doppler. Pulmonary venous flow Doppler velocity, we can measure the S wave, D wave, and A wave reversal. And again, because this is a blood pool Doppler, the sample volume should be one to three millimeter. And we have to go deep inside the vein, about one to two centimeter deep inside the vein. TR velocity, we can measure it very well, uh, again in uh, four chamber view, and uh, we can measure it in other views as well. LA volume, uh, in transthoracic, we do it in apical four chamber and two chamber view uh, by method of disc. In TE, we can't measure the LA volume, we just can measure the LA dimension, and I will show you how we do it. These measurements are in a specific disease. When we say a specific disease, I will show you the list of the specific diseases, like MS, like MR, like atrial fibrillation. And we do these measurements only on that type of disease, not in every patient. So we can measure the mitral inflow A wave duration. We can measure the mitral E-wave acceleration rate in atrial fibrillation is very important and I will show you a slide how we do it. Mitral inflow color propagation velocity. Pulmonary vein systolic filling fracture. D-wave deceleration time and A-wave reversal duration. I will show you in a slide how we do it. Another thing that we can measure it and is very useful in MS patient and MR patient is the time to the E 
and time to the E prime. And again, I will show you in one slide. While salva maneuver, we can do it in transtasic in T is not possible. This slide is showing the mitral inflow. As you can see, the E wave is bigger than A. When we are younger, the E wave is bigger than A. And sometimes even it might reach to two to one, the ratio. And when we get older, the E wave will be smaller, smaller than A, but not the ratio of the E to A less than 0.8. If it goes down to less than 0.8, that's a sign of uh, diastolic dysfunction. Uh, this is again how to use the uh, apical four chamber view to put the sample volume at the tip of the mitral valve and measure the E wave and A wave. Then the slide in the right side is again the checking the mitral inflow uh, E wave and A wave by TE in apical four chamber view. Sometimes there is another wave between E and A. This wave is called L wave. This L wave is compatible with uh, moderate to severe diastolic dysfunction. We can do the L wave, we can measure it by tissue Doppler as well, but in blood Doppler is better. The reason that this wave was called L wave is because the first was described by a echo technician in Mayo Clinic. Her name was Caroline Lamb. So she described that wave and now we call it L wave because of the lamb. Uh, mitral inflow, as I said before, can be changed by Valsalva. Sometimes you have a mitral inflow of one patient here. You don't know E is bigger than A because of pseudonormal or is that just a normal? Can be both of them. Because in normal, E is bigger than A. In pseudonormal, again, E will be bigger than A. To differentiate these two, we can do a Valsalva. We can bring the pressure of the LA down. So we ask the patient to do a Valsalva. The venous return will decrease and the E pressure, the LA pressure will come down and E will be smaller. So if we did a Valsalva and E became smaller than A wave, we say that was a pseudo normal. It means LA pressure regularly is high. If the E is still after Valsalva was bigger than A wave, so we call that one normal. So this was way of differentiation between normal mitral inflow and pseudo normal. And we don't use it these days because now we have a tissue Doppler. This was before 1990 that we didn't have tissue Doppler. Again, this is the way that we, this cartoon will show how we do it in TE, how we measure the mitral inflow and how we measure the IVRT. We can put the sample volume between the tip of the mitral and the LVOT and measure the IVRT. IVRT is between the time of closing of the aortic valve to the opening of the mitral valve. This time, IVRT normally is 60 to 90 millis. This is the way how we do the LA volume. This is based on the transtrasic. We cannot do the LA volume by TE, and we, if we do it, we underestimate it. But we can measure the LA by T. See, this is the view, like a, a short axis view of the aortic valve, like a 60 degree. This LA dimension is antro-posterior dimension. Antro is here, posterior is here. Antro-posterior dimension is the same as LA dimension in this view of the transtasic. So this view, like a 50, 60 degree of the uh, transesophageal view is the same LA dimension as transesophageal and we can measure the dimension. But if we do volume, we will underestimate it. And this is a paper to show. 
we can measure the TR velocity by transtatic and we can measure the TR velocity by T as well. This slide is showing the use of pulmonary vein for assessment of the diastolic dysfunction. Uh, the slide in the left side shows that the S wave is always bigger than D, ex except in a very young people. Uh, if S became less than D after like the age of 40 or 50, we call it systolic blunting, and that can be because of diastolic dysfunction or because of the mitral regurgitation. The D wave deceleration time uh, less than 220 milliseconds is compatible with diastolic dysfunction, especially in atrial fibrillation. So this is one of the criteria that we can use it in atrial fibrillation. D wave deceleration time less than uh, 220 milliseconds. And the slide in the right side shows the systolic filling fraction. It means we trace the S wave, we trace the D wave, the ratio of the S wave tracing to the sum of S wave and D wave tracing that's called systolic filling fracture and has a use and when I am showing you the algorithm of the dysfunction I am going to talk about that one. Uh, this is again a, a pulmonary vein flow uh, by TE as the same as I showed before. This is a pulmonary vein in a patient that has a heart failure with preserved EF. And this is how we do color propagation. Color propagation velocity can be done by transtrinsic and by TE. So you are in an AP called four chamber view. You put the cursor line across the mitral inflow. You put the color and you go a color and mode and you can measure from the beginning of the mitral valve up to four centimeter. Usually color propagation velocity more than 45 centimeter is normal and less than 35 centimeter per second for sure is severe diastolic dysfunction. Again, this is not a routine measurement. This, this is a tissue Doppler, you are all familiar and you can do it from lateral in transtrinsic and septal. You can do it by T as well. Uh, so the tissue Doppler, our sample volume is the lateral. You have a E prime, A prime, and S prime is here. And this is the diagram. So here we have two important uh, measurement. Uh, you can do the deceleration time as you see it here, but this is very important. In this slide, uh, we have a patient that has atrial fibrillation. In atrial fibrillation, you cannot measure the E to A wave ratio because we don't have an A wave. So the best measurement in atrial fibrillation is E wave a velocity acceleration rate. So we have the mitral inflow. We put the cursor line here and we go up to tip of the E wave. We measure the acceleration rate. So the sharper goes up like vertical, that patient has a diastolic dysfunction. Less vertical, patient does not have a diastolic dysfunction. This acceleration rate, more than 1,900 centimeter per second two is compatible with diastolic dysfunction. So. E wave acceleration rate is one of the very good criteria to measure the diastolic dysfunction in AF patient. Another thing that you can do uh, in the uh, AF patient is D wave deceleration time. In the pulmonary vein flow, S wave, D wave, you can measure the D wave deceleration time if it's less than. Uh, if it's more than 220, that patient has 20 milliseconds. That patient has a diastolic uh, dysfunction. And uh, so if it's longer, patient has a diastolic dysfunction. 
At the same time, you can measure the A wave deceleration time. And this is how we do systolic filling fracture. So you can trace the S wave and the D wave and the take a ratio between S wave tracing to the sum of the S wave and the D wave as it's showing in this formula. This timing is very important. If the patient has a mitral stenosis and mitral regurg or mitral regurgitation, and you want to measure the diastolic dysfunction, you cannot use the E wave to E prime velocity because E wave in mitral regurgitation and mitral stenosis is increased. So the only thing that you can measure is the time to E wave to the time to the E prime. So you do the mitral inflow in apical four chamber view. You measure from R wave to the beginning of the E wave. Then you go tissue Doppler and measure the time from R wave to E prime. Regularly in patient with no diastolic dysfunction, this time R to E prime is shorter than this time R to E wave. If this time became longer than R to E wave, that patient has a diastolic dysfunction and there is a number I will show you. So the time to the tissue Doppler should be normally less than uh, blood Doppler. It became longer, patient has a diastolic dysfunction. So how we apply all this measurement to the patient? First of all, we have to ask ourselves, is this patient can have diastolic dysfunction? If can have it, we do it. Otherwise, there's no point to do it. Which type of patient they can have a diastolic dysfunction? The patient with coronary artery disease, they can have a diastolic dysfunction. The patient that has a LVH, pathologic LVH for any reason, like hypertension, AS patient, they have a diastolic dysfunction. Patient that they have a LV systolic dysfunction, they can have a diastolic dysfunction. So based on this new guideline, anybody has a LV systolic dysfunction, by default has a diastolic dysfunction. If the patient has a heart failure with preserved EF, can have a diastolic dysfunction. If patient has an abnormal strain, can have a diastolic dysfunction. So we do diastolic dysfunction in a patient that has one of these underlying disease. Uh, otherwise, we know the patient does not have a diastolic dysfunction and we don't have to do the measurement. The guideline gave us two algorithm. Assume we did all the measurement at, that I talked before and now we put in these two algorithm. Algorithm A and then next time I will show you the algorithm B. Algorithm A says assessment of LV diastolic dysfunction or LV diastolic function in a patient that has a normal EF. LV EF is normal. We use the four criteria. We use average E to E prime. When we say average means E prime of the lateral and E prime of the septal, we did both of them and we took an average. This is one criteria. Criteria number two is septal E prime less than seven or lateral E prime less than 10. So this is one. TR velocity more than 2.8. LA volume index more than 34 milliliter per meter square. Obviously, we don't have this number four in T. So anytime less than two of them are positive, it means only one positive, that patient does not have diastolic dysfunction. So less than 50%. If it's more than 50% positive, that patient has a diastolic dysfunction. If it's just 50%, it means two are positive, two are negative, we say this is indeterminate. It means we cannot say 
the patient has a diastatic dysfunction. So, less than two positive, no diastatic dysfunction. More than two positive, there is a diastatic dysfunction. Two positive, two negative is an indeterminate. Then we go to, so first we diagnose that patient has a diastatic dysfunction or not. And the second algorithm, we go and see uh, what is the grade of the diastatic dysfunction. This algorithm. This algorithm, you have to look at it and you have to look at it many times and use it on patient to learn, otherwise it's difficult. Again, in this algorithm, we go based on the E to A ratio. If E to A ratio is less than 0.8 and E wave is less than 50, we go grade one. So in grade one diastolic dysfunction, it means patient LA pressure is not high. It's just grade one diastolic dysfunction. In other way, if the E to A ratio is more than two, that patient has a grade three or severe diastolic dysfunction. So grade three diastolic dysfunction and grade one is easy. Grade one E to A ratio is less than 0.8. Grade three is more than two. Anytime E to A ratio is between 0.8 and two or E to A is less than 0.8, but the E wave is more than 50, we go to the middle. When we are in the middle, it means it's not grade one, it's not grade three. We look at other criteria. These all criteria I showed you how we measure it. We go average E to E prime more than 14, TR velocity more than 2.8, LA volume more than 34. Again, from these three criteria, if two of the three or three are negative, we go grade one. If two of the three or three are positive, we go grade two. If only two criteria are available, two negative, we go to the grade one, two positive, we go to the grade two, and one positive, one negative, we call it indeterminate. This is the only group that we cannot determine the diastolic dysfunction by echocardiography. So this is a little bit difficult algorithm and you have to a little bit memorize it, but if you practice it a couple of times, it will be easy. There are some special disease that we cannot use our uh, regular measurement and as I showed you, we have to do extra measurements like atrial fibrillation. In atrial fibrillation, E to E prime ratio instead of 14, more than 11 has a meaning. So more than 11 is diastolic dysfunction. As I said, I showed you before, peak acceleration rate, we can measure it. If it's more than 1,900 centimeters per second too, that patient has a diastolic dysfunction. IVRT, we can use it and deceleration time of the pulmonary vein less than 220 millisecond patient has diastolic dysfunction i think in previous uh, table i said more than 220 less than 220 so less than 220 uh, is compatible with diastolic dysfunction uh, in systolic tachycardia it's difficult to assess the diastolic dysfunction uh, we have to bring the heart rate down to measure it in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, again, we can take the average of the E to E prime. Uh, in restrictive cardiomyopathy, that's a measurement that we can use it. Uh, sometimes we have a high TR velocity, but patient does not have diastolic dysfunction, has just lung disease. In mitral stenosis and mitral regurgitation, as I told you before, we can measure that time time of the E minus E prime and the ratio of the IVRT to that time less than 4.2 in MS or less than 5.6 in MR is compatible with diastolic. So these three special diseases you might uh, be dealing in the OR, AF patient, mitral stenosis patient and MR patient, these are the criteria that you have to measure it 
to assess the diastolic dysfunction in this special disease. So I recommend all of you to remember these three conditions, AF patient, mitral stenosis, and mitral regurgitation, how we do the diastolic dysfunction, because this table, usually one or two questions might come in the exam. So this was the first part of my talk about uh, echo assessment of the diastolic dysfunction. It is a little bit difficult. As I told you, the guideline is a difficult guideline. Probably this year or next year, American society will change it. But still, we apply it right now. It's so difficult that many echo lab, even they don't report the diastolic dysfunction. Uh, uh, even in our echo lab, uh, many cases, they don't report it at all. Uh, but we should learn how to do it. And if we do it and we do it as a routine, it will be gradually easy. So the second part of the talk is echocardiography and cardiomyopathy. This is very short. You already, you know the cardiomyopathy very well. You have it in the war in elevat room many times. Uh, we have dilated cardiomyopathy, we have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you see it always during the myectomy. We have a restrictive cardiomyopathy that you usually don't see them in the OR, maybe you see them in the heart transplant. Uh, this is different shape of the different types of cardiomyopathy. Cardiomyopathy are the disease of the myocardium without having coronary artery disease, without having valvular heart disease. So the disease of the myocardium without valvular heart disease, without coronary artery disease. And this is the classification of WHO for cardiomyopathy, disease of the myocardium associated with cardiac dysfunction. This is the classification of American Heart Association for cardiomyopathy. Again, you can read it and most of this you know it. We can classify the cardiomyopathy as a primary, as a secondary. Primary is it can be a genetic, can be a mixed, can be acquired cardiomyopathy, like a stress-induced cardiomyopathy, prepartum cardiomyopathy, tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy, and the secondary cardiomyopathy, the most famous one is amyloidosis. Of the cardiomyopathy, and I hope these movies, they move. So this is a first patient you see very dilated LV and very poor and you see here there is a severe uh, mitral regurgitation so this is a short axis of the LV you see LV function is very poor you see the LV beside the function is poor when you go more to the apex of the LV this is transverse echo a trabeculation of the LV, so it's a, a hypertrabeculation. When you go to the apex of the LV, you see the LV looks like a highly trabeculated. It's called spongium myocardium. This is a disease we call it non-compaction, LV non-compaction. This is almost a unclassified cardiomyopathy. Some people believe this is uh, congenital because we can see them in pediatric patients as well. We, we, I reported the case uh, age of five. I published it. You can go by my name and see it in pediatric. Uh, so this LV non uh, has a deep recesses and meshwork at the LV apex. This is a type of cardiomyopathy. It's not common, but it's a very bad disease and doesn't have any solution except uh, you can see takes the apex more. So the, the definition is if you measure the sickness of the non-compact part, ratio to the compact part is more than two to one. So if the non-compacted area more than compacted is more than two to one, we call it non-compaction. In our heart, in normal heart, the ratio of the non-compacted part compacted is like a 0 0.2, 0 0.3. It 
means most of the heart is compacted in normal heart. In these people, heart is not compacted. Uh, again, you see the, the meshwork of the apex and deep is the apical four chamber view. They usually come with all uh, manifestation of the cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy. They come with MR, they come with LV thrombosis, they come with um, arrhythmia, and they can have involvement of the RV as well. So most of the LV non-compaction is common in LV, but can happen in RV as well. And when it happens in RV, you will have a severe tear. So this is a, a cartoon of that, and this is the specimen. You see the LV, it has a lots of trabeculation, and it's not compacted. It's not like here, it's not compacted. So that's a very bad disease, and thanks God it's not. This two is an 82-year-old man presented to our center due to severe shortness of breath. No history of hypertension. So again, this is a transthoracic echo. You see there's a severe LVH, but patient doesn't have hypertension, doesn't have an AS as well. So anytime you see a patient has a LVH, no hypertension, no AS, and an old is old patient, probably is amyloidosis, cardiac amyloidosis. LV myocardium is very bright. We call it speckling or sparkling and systolic function at the beginning is normal gradually will decrease this is short axis severe hypertrophy another disease that will give severe hypertrophy without hypertension is fabre disease that is not common but amyloidosis is almost common that's a mitral influence so this is the strain you have a strain in your machine, you can do it. So when we do a strain for amyloidosis, you see the apex is contracting very well, but the base is not contracting. Contracting is shown by red, is not going is showed by blue. This is the strain of the patient with, and here again, you can see it. The apex is red, is contracting very well. The rest is not contracting. So we say the amyloidosis has an apical spading. Apex is not diseased. The rest has a disease. We do a, a see here, the bull's eye, uh, 17 segment together. You see at the middle is red. The rest is less red and uh, or is blue. And uh, this appearance is called uh, cherry at the top of the cake because the middle is like a cherry and the rest is not cherry so this is a very classic appearance of the cardiac amyloidosis and this is a specimen of the cardiac amyloidosis severe hypertrophy and you can make a diagnosis with a different a special type of stain Okay, thank you very much. Anyway, I hope it was recorded well, and I will recommend you, especially about diastolic dysfunction, to practice it in the OR. Uh, also, some uh, patient, younger patient, they might not have diastolic dysfunction when they have a valvular disease, but you can practice it in every patient, and the only way to learn it is just practice.